Good morning. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, I am Mohammed Atif, and I am representing MCI. And as you can see, this particular presentation is a joint presentation by National Computational Infrastructure in Australia and Mellanox Technologies. So the title is Chasing the Rainbow in Pursuit of High Performance OpenStack Cloud. So uh, before I head to the main presentation, I'll just give you a bit of overview of NCI. Uh, what is NCI? NCI is National Computational Infrastructure, and it is Australia's most highly integrated e-infrastructure uh, environment. So we have got a petaflop system, which was the first in Southern Hemisphere. Uh, we have got uh, around 25 petabytes of luster storage, which is, again, uh, we have got the largest deployment of luster in Southern Hemisphere, as well as we have got a high-performance cloud. So in short, this is what we provide. We are located in Canberra, Australia. And th for those of you who don't know, Canberra is capital city of Australia. Most of the people confuse Sydney as a capital of Australia. So NCI provides a full broad spectrum of research. So we have got users from pure sciences, strategic sciences, applied and industry. Uh, you name a field and there would be a researcher probably doing some sort of batch processing or cloud computing or big data analysis at NCI. Um, today, NCI is around 2,500 active users who actually log on to our system. So this particular 2,500 is people who have actually submitted jobs in past four months. We have got around 500 projects. We have got eight out of 22 uh, Science Academy fellows. And our name is in around 1,500 academic papers per year. Um, NCI is divided into two basic components, services and technologies. I am part of the services and technologies. We look after the infrastructure. And then there is another group, which is research engagement and innovation. These are the people who actually are trying to optimize HPC applications or working on virtual environments or data collections. So coming to the cloud, this is what we are here for. NCI has been doing cloud computing since 2009. It's a long way back. So initially, we started with a VMware cloud uh, in 2009. We were doing web services at that particular point in time, mission critical, dual site redundant, live migration via VMware. OpenStack was, I think, not even born then. So that's why we were using VMware. Uh, then in 2010, this was our first HPC in virtualization. Uh, uh, we came up with DCC cluster, which stands for Data Compute Cluster, and cluster again, so it's redundant. But uh, we ran this particular cluster, which was partially virtualized under VMware. So it had few components, which were bare metal, and then there were few virtual machines, which were part of the cluster. And it was using 10 gig Ethernet, Intel, Xeon, Vesmere CPUs. And it was basically used for workloads that were not typically suited for NHPC environment. So we run a supercomputer. And there was a workload which required installing Oracle database inside a compute node. Technically, uh, if you ask any HPC facility, can you do that? They are just going to refuse flatly. What we did was, because we had virtualized environment, we were more agile. So we installed Oracle Database inside a compute node and let people do their processing. This was also first time, I believe, in Australia that we actually oversubscribed HPC facility. So DCC, virtualized cluster, we were using oversubscription of CPUs, the reason being there were for workloads which were not exactly HPC workloads. They were actually high throughput. People were not looking for my application should finish in 20 minutes. 
they said, I'm fine if my application finishes in 30 minutes and if I'm able to run 10 more applications because they were embarrassingly parallel applications. So we actually experimented with uh, oversubscription of CPUs and it worked brilliantly. Then uh, this particular cluster was an, again one of the first clusters in the world which actually had native luster mounts for the virtual machines and it was based on one sys diskless boot for VMs as well. So we were not actually using disks. So we were using one sys, so it was diskless booting of virtual machines. Then in 2010, again, we had an unnamed cluster. I don't know why we didn't name it. Probably we didn't care. We just called it cloud. Uh, so for this one, we actually experimented with EC2. It was first experimental EC2 cloud. We first experimented with Eucalyptus. You might have heard of that particular infrastructure. It's just like OpenStack, uh, EC2 compatible. And we just couldn't get Eucalyptus to become stable enough. And in two months' time, we saw the light. We moved to OpenStack. And believe me, in two weeks' time, we were production with OpenStack. So our experience with OpenStack in 2010 was quite good, uh, which is against most of the people would, you would hear from people uh, that it was not stable, but it was quite stable. Uh, then in 2012, we had another Red Hat-based cloud, and surprisingly, in Monday's keynote, I found NCI's logo uh, when the CTO of Red Hat was presenting. So yes, we partnered with Red Hat. It was an enterprise-grade cloud, it's predominantly for virtual machines, nothing to do with HPC. Uh, the best outcome for this particular OpenStack cloud is that its uptime is 100%. It never really went down. Uh, 2013, we partnered with Nectar, which is basically Australian consortium for virtualization. And we uh, made this Nectar Research Cloud production. So NCI basically is one of the eight nodes in Australia, which is part of this federation, Nectar Federation. Uh, the main uh, essence of this federation is that Australian researchers should be able to launch their virtual machines and they should give them frictionless environment for conducting their research. Uh, our node is in, consisting of Intel Sandy Bridge 3200 cores with hyperthreading. And we were the first, one of the first clouds in the world which actually used full fat tree 56 gigabit ethernet provided by Mellanox. Uh, yes, when we were going production, we were questioned by a number of people. Why are you going with such an expensive network stack and such expensive uh, CPUs? Most of the people at that time were thinking, we should go with 10 gig Ethernet plus AMDs. But once we pro went production, people saw that why we opted for expensive Intel processors and full fat tree 56 gig Ethernet by Mellanox. So each of these compute nodes, um, so the whole, this whole cloud was based on the experience from our DCC cluster. So in this particular case, we went with SSDs on the compute nodes uh, in RAID 0 format, so they, the local storage is very fast. We have access to half a petabyte of self storage, which is again part of the same fabric. It's not coming from 10 gig links. It's part of the 56 gigabit full fat tree. And there is one issue with this particular cloud, and that is we cannot provide um, luster to this particular cloud due to security models. I would talk about this thing later on. Uh, in 2013, we launched our flagship cloud. We called it Tenjin. Uh, it's a called god of scholar in Japanese. We are going with Japanese teams nowadays in, uh, at NCI. Uh, it's the same hardware as that of Nectar, full fat tree, but we have divided it into two parts. One part is high density zone, where we are using oversubscription of CPUs. This is for web services or bursty loads. And then there is another zone in this particular cloud, which is high performance computing zone. 
it has got one-on-one -on -one ratio. So no oversubscription of CPU, memory, or any other thing. Based on RDO with Neutron, uh, and we are on CentOS 7. Point X, whatever is the latest CentOS, we just update that thing. Architected for big data. Uh, the main differentiating factor of this cloud with Nectar is that this one has got access to Lustre because we can control uh, who gets access to Lustre on this one. Plus, we also have access to SRIOV, single root IO virtualization by Mellanox. Uh, I'll talk about this thing later on as well. Uh, we are experimenting with bare metal or InfiniBand cloud, so no Ethernet involved. It's uh, based on ICE house. It's fairly old, heavily modified by NCI and Mellanox, so we are working quite closely with Mellanox on this one. And if we are able to get native IB working, we'll just move Tangent to uh, InfiniBand. So we call it InfiniCloud. And then we are also conducting some experiments with containers. Uh, we have used Docker on our cloud, and we are soon going to experiment singularity, which is another concept. It's just a container, but I believe much more <coughs> suited for HPC. Systems connectivity, this is a very, very important slide. You would get to know why NCI is, have, is building OpenStack Cloud, despite the fact that we have got one of the biggest clusters in the world. Uh, so we have got Rygen, and then its file system, which is red, Rygen file system. Around 7.6 petabyte of slash short storage. It is 150 gigabytes per second, fastest file system in Southern Hemisphere. But we cannot export. In fact, we do not export this file system anywhere else. It's sandboxed. It's for the supercomputer. Then NCI also has got slash G slash data. So we call them global datas, and as you can see, these are, again, Lustre-based, around 25 petabytes of usable storage, connected via 56 gigabit InfiniBand. And this, these three file systems, or four or five, whatever, we, we continue to grow these things, they are mounted across our supercomputer, as well as our OpenStack cloud. And it's also backed up to our mass data tape storage. <clears throat> Why? We want to give people end-to-end -end solutions. So their workflow, if you are working on a certain project which requires pre-processing of your compute jobs on cloud, you can do so on cloud. Then you can submit your job onto a supercomputer. You get the results. You hop back onto cloud, do some processing, post-processing, visualize it. So everything at NCI. So you don't have to shunt your data here and there. So this is what I was talking about, end-to-end -end data lifecycle. One of the examples, you get your data into NCI, one-time operation, or you can even generate data at NCI. You do your ma data management, pre-processing of jobs, submit the job to HPC, get the results, visualize it, use MATLABs of the world using our cloud or virtual desktop interface. A few of other examples that we have, why we use OpenStack at NCI is we are part of uh, Earth System Grids Federation, which is IPCC project. So I guess it won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2003, uh, IPCC 3 version. Uh, again, what people have done is they have generated their data on our supercomputer, and now they are exporting this data to researchers around the world using our cloud. And it also enables researchers to do web, web time analytics of the data. It's predominantly for climate sciences. Uh, another interesting thing is we have got environmental data virtual labs. We call it Climate and Weather Science Laboratory. It's a virtual desktop environment. Again, because G-Data is mounted across supercomputer and cloud, you can pre-process your jobs, do a remote job submission. You don't even have to log into our supercomputer for this thing. Again, virtual desktops are being used at NCI. It is one of the most uh, utilized features, and people are using it for a number of their tools. Uh, we have got a lot of virtual laboratories, which are production, geophysical, uh, geodesy, climate, water laboratory, and more and more are being added at NCI. Um, one of the first. Uh, 
uses of cloud at NCI was for this particular project, which is uh, water indentation due to a tsunami. So basically, if there is a tsunami, let's say in or an earthquake around New Zealand, we can simulate it using OpenStack Cloud and get to know about water indentation in Sydney area or any other coastal areas. So this is the architecture of Tengen. Everything is based around IB switching fabric. So I'm not going to go into the details, but yes, we can mount Lustre, we have got Ceph, we have got other things, but everything is centered around our IB switching fabric, which is 56 gig of, using a Mellanox 56 gigabit Ethernet. Now, virtual labs and other stuff, they can exist on AMDs of the world in 10 gig Ethernet. Why NCI is using high performance cloud. So this is uh, statistics from our supercomputer. Uh, it's a bit year or year and a half old, but this holds true for every quarter. So this one is for only 43 days, where we actually uh, catered for around 621,000 jobs in 43 days. It's a lot of jobs on a supercomputer. What you can see here in the upper right is number of cores. And this red line is 16 cores or less. Jobs requesting 16 cores or less. In terms of CPU hours or real workload, it's nothing. We are dominated by 256 CPU jobs, 512 CPU jobs, or 4096 CPU jobs. So most of the people have gone parallel in HPC. They don't really want to run, I shouldn't say puny jobs, which are on a single node only. So this doesn't do justice to a supercomputer. But having said that, if you look at number of jobs, not the CPU hours by these jobs, number of jobs, single CPU job, jobs are over 300,000. So out of 620,000 jobs, 300,000 jobs, half of these jobs are single CPU jobs. These jobs are essentially for pre-processing or post-processing. Raijin, or a supercomputer, is basically a batch operating system. If you are using it for post-processing, you might have to wait for one or two hours or three hours for your job to actually get scheduled. And then interactive analysis, they are possible on a supercomputer, but it's still painful. So this is one of the reasons we have gone with high-performance cloud. So, for us, high performance cloud is to complement this NCI supercomputer. Single noted jobs are not big fun for a supercomputer. So we invest a lot of money in a supercomputer. We want to utilize the network the way it should be utilized. We want virtual laboratories. We want remote job submission, web services, on-demand access to GPUs. We have done this thing. Uh, workloads which are not, not best suited for Lustre. So, Probably all of you know about Lustre. It's a parallel file system. But one problem with Lustre is it doesn't really play well with uh, jobs or applications which are writing tiny I.O. So IOPS hungry applications do not scale at Lustre. And this is where we are using Ceph or other file systems, experimenting with other file systems. Uh, then there are pipelines which are not best suited for the supercomputer, like the example Oracle database requirement inside a compute node, never going to happen on a supercomputer, but on cloud, why not? Uh, we want to do cloud bursting, more on this one later, but the idea being once our supercomputer runs out of capacity, we should be able to seamlessly migrate single CPU jobs onto a cloud. We are, in fact, experimenting this thing with Amazon as well, so that if somebody has submitted a job at NCI, a lot of jobs are there. We are out of capacity. We should seamlessly migrate their jobs onto Amazon. They get their job processed, and the results are then seamlessly transferred onto NCI data store. Student courses, RDMA is essential. Uh, you cannot do it on 10 gig Ethernet. I mean, now you can do it because most of these providers are giving you RDMA. And the last thing is everything sh should be centered at NCI. You don't need to shunt your data back and forth. Everything should be at NCI. So few of the experimental results. Uh, 
I'm going to quickly go through these things. So uh, what I've done is we have compared Raijin, which is our supercomputer, with Tenjin, which is our cloud based on 56 gigabit Ethernet, with Tenjin again, but this time with containers. No virtual machines, we just went with containers. Plus, we experimented it with 10 gig cloud. I'm not going to name this cloud, but probably you all can guess. Point to point latency, I'm using OSU, Ohio State University benchmarks. For this one, it's point to point latency. That means there are two virtual machines, 16 CPUs each, but we are only using one CPU or one process per virtual machine. And we are sending data across trying to determine what is the latency. Lower is better. The last line, the green one, is Ryzen, which is we want to beat this line. And the highest latency came out of, oh, sh I forgot to remove this thing, AWS. Uh, the difference is so huge that I had to use log scale to show these results. But the main essence or takeaway is Tenjin Rocky is quite close to Ryzen or native InfiniBand which is a very, very good thing for us. So we further experimented with this thing. This is bandwidth results. Again, uh, 10 gig Ethernet, nowhere near, but if you see this blue line in the middle, Tension Rocky, it climbs up uh, after 32K and matches bandwidth that of normal InfiniBand. Why after 32K? Because we are using uh, jumbo frames on our cloud, uh, whereas on right hand side of things, MTU is set at 1500, so it's latency driven, whereas on the cloud, because it's for HP, uh, data processing, so we have opted for big MTU size. Uh, then we ran some experiments using a single node job. This is for bioinformatics, which is the next big thing for HPC or in science. What you can see is Tenjin and Raijin, they are just competing quite close to each other when there is no network involved. In fact, we are beating Raijin in butterfly benchmark because of SSDs, whereas Raijin has got uh, normal hard drives here. So this was quite an interesting result. Then we moved ahead with NAS parallel benchmarks. These are small kernels which have got different communication patterns. For example, CG is neighborhood, neighbor communication, and FT is Fourier transforms, which actually use all-to-all -all communication. In this one, the main takeaway, so what I'm doing is we are comparing 32 processes and 60, uh, 64 processes. And the results are normalized with respect to 32 processes on uh, 10 GB cloud, which is gray. Now, what you can see is 10 GB cloud it does scale, if you see from the first gray and second gray, not that much. Whereas we have increased the processes from 32 to 64. It's double the size of processes. It should have scaled well. It's not scaling. But if we look at Tengen, it's not close to Raijin in any case, but it's scaling very, very well. So it's order of, let's say, four times faster than a 10 gig cloud, which technically makes sense, 10 gig and 56 gig. Uh, another interesting thing is when we used containers, we got results which were matching Raijin. So if you are using containers with Rocky, you are going to get almost native performance. So this was very, very interesting result for us. Um, I'm going to skip through this thing. This, these are communication profiles. Uh, we then ran molecular dynamics code, NAMD. Everybody loves, loves to run this NAMD code because it scales well. It's a real application. Uh, I have decided not to compare it with 10 gig cloud because it was just using AMDs, or even if with Intel, it was just very slow. So no point in showing that those clouds are slow. The main essence is Raijin scales quite well. Up to, we have scaled it up to 128 processes. Whereas Tenjin, which is using Rocky, in fact, it's not using Rocky, I'll tell you about this thing, but it scales quite well up to 64. It continues to scale, but there is this linearity go goes away. So from 64 to 128 processes, it's not scaling that well, but it's still scaling. Uh, Rocky, on the other hand, with containers, 
it is scaling well. I couldn't do experiments for 128 cores because I ran out of my test kit. We'll continue with these experiments. But one interesting thing that we found was the best results for Tenjin or our cloud using Mellanox Interconnect was not with Rocky, not with Mellanox MXM or Yala interfaces. It was with TCP interfaces. So the main takeaway from this particular thing, and we are going to experiment uh, these things in detail as well, is when you are running something on cloud, you have to be very, very sure what sort of underlying network communication or what we say in OpenMPI byte transfer layer, BTL, you have to use. We got the best results with TCP BTL, whereas in NAS parallel benchmarks and other, we got the best performance from Yala interface. For bandwidth tests, we actually got the best performance from Rocky. Rocky. So you have to make sure which BTL you want to use. Uh, one interesting thing is NUMA. What we have found is this is an in-house application run by one of our guys. He's the developer of this code, and he suggested my code is not scaling. It's not because of any network interface. It's because of lack of NUMA. Please fix it. So I think NUMA is now being made available with Liberty Release. I have not tested it. We are on Kilo. But this is actually hurting us. NCI is committed to HPC. We actually want researchers to get along with their research. Raijin, or our supercomputer, is heavily, heavily oversubscribed. Not oversubscribed, but very, very busy. So there are people who just don't get time. So what we did is we have released some open source tools which behave like Raijin. So your job submission script on Raijin, our supercomputer, is going to run on these clusters as well. Uh, if you spin off your cluster on Nectar Cloud, so we have made it open source. We also worked with Intel and Amazon, and we have released Raijin in a box using Spot Instances. Spot Instances is a fantastic concept where you just bid for your virtual machines. So rather than paying a dollar for your 16 CPU HPC virtual machine, you can just say, I'm only going to bid 29 cents. And if their data center does not have that much of load, they make it available. If the data center runs out of this load, they give you two minutes, and they kill your VM. In those two minutes, you might be able to checkpoint your jobs. It's a fantastic concept. Have a look at our uh, YouTube video as well, how to build a supercomputer using AWS spot instances. Uh, if you are short in money, it's one of the best ways to get into HPC. Another interesting thing what we want to do is bring HPC clusters, uh, instead of bringing HPC to the cloud, why not bring cloud to the HPC? It's controversial, but it's possible. So we can run containers and singularity inside our HPC cluster. We don't really have to spin it off using OpenStack Cloud. Uh, it's just an interesting thing. Uh, so my conclusion is, yes, HPC, we are still chasing the rainbow. I don't see my rainbow because there are certain aspects where we are still not able to match the performance of a supercomputer. Uh, parallel jobs run well on the cloud, but is it actually HPC? No, it's not HPC, because in HPC, people ask me this question often, where did my cycle go? I cannot tell where your cycle went because the hypervisor just ate it. Another thing is it's good for high throughput computing. So if you want to have a lot of jobs and you don't care about how fast your job finishes, it's perfect. Another interesting uh, takeaway is single noted performance. It's at par with bare metal, not a big surprise. It was there. Uh, we wanted to have hardware performance counters on virtual machines. I think KVM has made it available now, uh, starting from Linux kernel 3.3. We have not tested it, but hardware performance counters are must if you want to go into HPC. People will just simply say, I'm not going to run this job on a virtualized cloud because I just cannot find the characteristics of my job. Uh, bare metal provisioning, all these other things are just, um, technically, I'm just ranting about this thing. But one thing that we found interesting was locality where scheduling is missing in OpenStack. Come on, guys. It's 2016 now. 
locality-aware scheduling is a must requirement. It should be network-aware, it should be NUMA-aware. We just cannot live with this puny or strange greedy algorithm that OpenStack uses by default. People are working on this thing. I found, I saw a couple of very interesting presentations. So that's pretty much from my side. I'll ask Chloe from Melanox who gave Melanox. Thanks, Mohammed, for sharing your experience and uh, NCI benchmarks. So I'm going to start my part of the presentation, which is going to be short, um, by giving you a quiz. So I want to talk about basically some of my revelation about cloud. So this is a worldwide shipment, unit shipment of something, some electronics gadgets that you all know. Who, take, who can take a guess of what this would be? Come on. Uh, almost, it's a, it's a digital steel camera. So basically, um, the shipment kind of peaked around 2008, and uh, it started a steep decline around 2011 and 12. So who can tell me what happened in 2007? Yes, so basically the first iPhone was shipped uh, in 2007. That kind of uh, coincided with the decline of the digital steel camera. So um, actually, um, we're seeing a transition. This is just one example. Basically a transition from special purpose hardware gadgets and appliances and solutions to in this case, it's a common mobile computing platform, which it can be iPhone or Android, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, now um, on the iPhone, you can actually run multiple software applications that realize the functionality of the special purpose hardware gadgets that you used to have. And they can actually do a much better job. For example, I can load up my Yelp, find the restaurant I like, call them, and uh, find the directions, order, delivery, et cetera, et cetera, all within the same device. And over the years since iPhone, the first iPhone was released, the computing power actually increased about 84 times. So the platform is becoming, the common computing platform is becoming good enough to run the majority of your workload. Uh, not, maybe not all, but the majority of your workload. So this is a similar transition from a special purpose built environment to more of a common computing uh, environment like the OpenStack cloud. So if you went to the Monday keynote session, Gartner talked about bimodal IT, and this effect is being seen in the HPC space also. So for the HPC cluster, it's really designed to provide high performance computing, and normally accommodates a single tenant, multi-users, but same single tenant. And it's really built for large niche distributed workload, and sometimes they are tightly coupled, and you have to use RDMA to basically communicate between the computing nodes. And in terms of uh, data isolation and protection, which is important for genomic, genomic research, bioinformatics type of workload, it's really poor in the HPC cluster. And for, for cloud, it's really built for a different purpose. Um, it's built for agility for uh, quick access to computing resources, ease of use, and experimentation of your ideas, and elasticity um, of your resource pool. And it can accommodate multi-tenant, and normally run a more generic workload, loosely coupled, but it has really good data isolation and uh, protection. So this is similar to, for example, a digital SLR camera uh, that some of the avid um, photographers will definitely never um, get rid of, and an iPhone that has a good enough camera, but it's a common compute 
platform that can enable you to do many things very quickly. Uh, when we look at the workload, it's really not black and white. Web services run in the cloud and HPC workload run in the HPC cluster. And we see the world more in 50 shades of gray. So the new generation of scientific research computing really has many type of workloads that has different requirements on data isolation, on workload affinity, data access, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, the key message of my part is if you don't remember anything I say, remember this. So no matter where you draw the line, whether it's horizontal or depending on the workload size, Mellanox always provides you the highest performance network for your data access and workload communications. So how do we do that? Uh, when we move to the cloud, it's not necessarily always true, but it's normally associated with virtualization. So that you can run virtual machines and uh, um, utilize your resources much better and have much better agility. But along with virtualization, there are a few kinds of penalties in terms of performance. With compute virtualization, it introduces a hypervisor. So with bare metal, you're driving down a very fast freeway. Now with a hypervisor, you're adding a tow booth. So you're slowed down, especially uh, with I.O. performance. And uh, with network virtualization and software-defined networking, one of the very popular way of doing SDN is using overlay style. Um, you're having an additional packet header, the VXLAN or NVGRE header, uh, to differentiate between different tenants. And uh, not all NIC card adapters can recognize this new packet format and handle it properly. And that actually brings some of the tedious packet processing tasks to the CPU, such as checksum, cal uh, checksum calculation, uh, RSS, and large packet offload, et cetera, et cetera. And also, uh, it's inefficient network protocols, um, transport layer protocols for some workload. Um, if you look at TCP IP, it's really designed, it started from wide area network, uh, from very lossy and slow links. Um, so it has to accommodate packet loss at the link layer. Um, so as a result, it has a lot of built-in mechanism to handle uh, handshakes and uh, sequence number checks, etc. that must be done in the CPU. But uh, there are new generation of protocols can, that can eliminate this kind of uh, inefficiencies. So uh, how do we overcome these? Um, we use SRLV, single root I.O. virtualization, to basically overcome the compute virtualization penalty. So we enable you to bypass the hypervisor and the OVS and have application direct access from the virtual machine to the, the, the network NIC card itself. Um, and then in terms of uh, the SDN and network virtualization penalty, we have VXLAN offload. Uh, actually, it's not restricted to VXLAN. It also in, supports MEGRE and in the future, Genev. Uh, basically, if you look at the benchmarks that we run with multiple SDN partners, uh, the light green bar shows basically bare metal VLAN performance in terms of throughput and CPU load. And the moment you turn on VXLAN, if you don't have VXLAN offload, you go to the red bar. So basically, it's significantly lowered um, throughput at a much higher CPU utilization. And then the dark green bar shows when you turn on the excellent offflow, you basically go back to bare metal performance. So this gets increasingly important when the speed of the interconnect goes up from 10 to 25 to 40 to 100. And to overcome the transport protocol inefficiencies, uh, we use RDMA. So I don't need to explain RDMA in the HPC community. Um, it does kernel bypass and protocol offload. And all the date I.O. 
operations can be done in the, the NIC card itself without CPU involvement. And as a result, we run um, data I.O. in both InfiniBand and Ethernet networks at 100 Gbps. So for OpenStack, we want to enable you to run at your optimal extreme performance no matter what you choose. If you want to use InfiniBand, we have OpenStack over InfiniBand. And uh, the ML2 uh, plugin is available since the Havana release. And we do the translation from your MAC addresses to, I mean, that's offered in the OpenStack scenario to GUID. And we do the VLAN to PK partition key mapping. And InfiniBand is inherently software defined. Um, the control plane and uh, data plane are always separated. And in terms of Ethernet, now Ethernet, not all Ethernet switches were born equal. So if you look at some of the dominant players in terms of Ethernet switching chips, such as Broadcom, uh, they came from more of the campus and uh, carrier Ethernet space, where some kind of loss is acceptable because the upper level protocols can handle it. And uh, the Mellanox Ethernet actually came from InfiniBand for the data center scenario, where we have very stringent requirement on performance and on packet loss. As a result, uh, for our latest generation of uh, Ethernet switching chip uh, and Ethernet switches uh, called Spectrum, supporting 10, 25, 40, 50, up to 100G, we have zero packet loss at any packet size, uh, up, I mean, down to the 64 byte smallest packet size. And we have low and consistent latency, as you can see on the bottom. Uh, our, our latency is consistent from uh, 64 byte up to the jumbo frame, 9K. Uh, as opposed to the Tomahawk chip, which gives you about 10 times of uh, latency when it gets to the jumbo frame. And also, we have very good microburst absorption capability. So this is really important for data analytics, Hadoop type of workload when you have in-cast. Uh, we can accommodate almost 10 times better um, microburst compared to the, the other switches based on Broadcom. So with that, uh, I want to close. And if you have further questions, go visit us at booth stand next to the, the basically the, the rock band. And uh, I'll invite Mohammed to come up if you have any questions. Three, two, one. Okay, thank you, everyone. Okay, I question. Had a, I, I had a question uh, in terms of uh, building this purpose built cloud. Um, you uh, basically uh, you know, tailored the cloud for performance. Uh, what were the trade offs in that? That's my first question. And the second question is, uh, what about the resiliency aspects? I think you show a number for 100% in the last two years, but I think that, that was for another cloud. It wasn't for Tejan. Yep. So, so if you can address those two aspects. Thank you. So in terms of uptimes, Tejan has got an uptime of 99.8%. It went down for a while, but it was due to power failure. And we fixed it. Uh, the other question was, uh, what did we have to sacrifice? Absolutely nothing, apart from spending a bit more money. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming to our session.